if you don't have a partner that supports this, you're fucked because you're going to be spending way more time with with the animals than you're going to be spending with your wife or husband or whatever. I say around five years, you're going to get an inclination if you have the ability. It's kind of like opening up a restaurant business. You're looking at breaking breaking even in three years. When it comes to the ball python industry, three years, you're, you're figuring out that a lot of your investments were bad investments. Uh, it's a, a huge, volatile market. I think there's a lot of people who think they're gonna like, you know, make it huge just because they dumped a lot of money into it. There's a lot of setbacks that happen just, you know, you know, out of nowhere, you'll open a tub and something's dead and for no reason at all. I think people think it's a lot easier than it is. Um, it is pretty tough, I gotta say. For every thousand dreamers, I think there's one person that has huge success. What's up, everyone? I'm Chris Eaton, and welcome to episode 89 of the old uh, Snakes and the Fat Man there. It got to where I was actually listening to Snakes and the Fat Man's podcast because it was funny, and it was enjoyable outside of just being about reptiles. Sean had ball shit, and there was another guy Josh something, mm -hmm. who who did a, a, a reptile podcast also, but there was only two people doing it at the time. Reptile radio was was of course around, but it, you know that they weren't killing it or anything. And I would listen to Sean's, and he would have people on that I would I wanted to hear about. And um, even back then, he would just cut these fucking people off, and he would make the whole thing about him. You know, like fucking, well, let me tell you why, you know, I was the first one to do this. And I was the first one to tell ARS to put bowls in their fucking tubs. And I was the first one to, to, to cut pizza into triangles and fucking, <laughs> like all- They invented all, the question mark. Yeah, I invented the question mark. Yeah, like fucking. So I, I just said to myself, man, if, if I want to know about the people that he's having on, the only way I'm going to do that is by talking to him myself. That started out, I was listening to podcasts and I found Snakes and the Fat Man and Bullshit. And then after I listened to all those episodes, my kids introduced me to YouTube and then I seen what was really going on on video and uh, the addiction started. He may have done it for a while before getting sponsors, but I think as soon as he got sponsors, I was the, one of the originals. In fact, that was the second episode he ever did. The first one was Ralph Davis, mm -hmm. which was a huge scoop for him. What's up, guys? It's Chris over at Eyeball Pythons. And on our first episode of Snakes and the Fat Man, just like if you slept with us, you're going to get slapped with the big one. After a few years out of the public eye, the king, Ralph Davis, is going to join us. Even though Eyeballs wasn't like this massive success, we, we had a lot of connections. We knew a lot of the big people. And so I think your first podcast was Ralph, Ralph right? So. It was like he came out of the gate like with like Ralph Davis and Will Banks and Ozzy and, Ozzy and, and all these guys. And it was like, it was cool because you knew these people to a certain extent from the shows and just from talking online a little, but then you really got to know them. I love to, you know, I always need stuff in my ear 
when I'm cleaning snake tubs. That's just my thing, you know. So whether it's music or podcasts and stuff too. So I just looked up some reptile podcasts. I found um, Sean's and then I found uh, Snakes and the Fat Man. And I remember just listening to like the first episode, I believe it was Ralph Davis. And that was somebody who I was always a big fan of anyway. Like When I first saw the 15 Minutes of Blame, I thought it was genius. I was watching Shane and uh, Shane Kelly, uh, Small Town Exotics. And at the time he was out of Bakersfield. And he went on this campaign. Now, mind you, I do not realize that this is the first time this is happening, this competition. And I'm, I'm speaking more so to the the uh, 15 Minutes of Lane champion. I'm not talking specifically to the show. I just thought it was genius in the fact that it lured people in to want to see who was going to win this. It lured people in to want to be a part of it. And again, this was its this was its first year. And it felt like in its first year that it had already been around for about 10 years. That this is what you had to be a part of it. I thought it was a huge positive thing for the ball python community, especially coming from one of the most negative ball python people in the community. Um, so just that irony in itself was, was definitely uh, alluring to, to the whole ball python world. Yeah, it was only audio. Uh, it was once a month. And actually, it was like right when I started listening is when Chris had some health problems and actually went on a hiatus for a little while for health reasons. Uh, which that kind of circles back around to my 15 minutes of lame story, actually. So like he started a comeback right as I was on my build and I got in 15 minutes of lame and we kind of like did it together. Yeah. Oh, this might make me look a little bad. Um, I, I just wanted to make fun of these people that I saw were dumping in you know, tens of thousands of dollars into this hobby and then saying in every interview, well, this is a growing year. You know, this is my year to grow. And then they're gone the following year. And I wanted to make fun of them about it. And then I started interviewing some people that were actually doing things the right way and made me look stupid. I'm like, well, you know, he might be doing this the right way. So I can't really shit all over him. The 15 Minutes of Lame is at the beginning of the show, and it started being people that I knew in that 15 Minutes of Lame. I didn't really know any of the people. I didn't personally know any of the people in the longer segment of his shows, but I was, you know, starting to recognize the people in the short segments. I did know, like, when Anton, Antoine got his uh, full-length video, I was like, oh, that was really cool, I, you know. I enjoyed his interview a lot, and they brought up several times that he had won the contest, and that's when I started thinking like, well, it'd be really cool if we won that contest. It'd be really cool if we got in on the 15 Minutes of Lame. That would open up, you know, a whole new group, of, like a whole new audience for us. A previous coworker of mine, somebody I'd worked with in a restaurant like six years ago, she posted that her boyfriend at the time had hatched out a clutch of eggs, a clutch of ball pythons, and they had hit a super banana. And I had seen different morphs when I bought Amos, our first ball python, but like something like a super banana, that sounded so cool to me. And this person was able to like pair two snakes together and get these really cool animals after his, it, during his very first clutch, the ver first clutch he ever hatched. I thought that was so cool and I wanted to try it. Um, and I brought it up to Steven, my fiance at the time. When Courtney got Amos, he was an awesome pet. He was super, super cool. And we all like really, really liked him. She came to me like, I don't know, three to six months after we had gotten him asking if she could breed ball pythons. And I, at the time, didn't know anything about the community. I didn't really know like much about ball pythons. And I was like, that's weird to know. And he was like, no, that's so weird. Why would you breed snakes? Then we'd have like 
10 snakes. What are we going to do with 10 snakes? And when I said, well, we'd sell the rest of them, he was essentially like, to who? Who's going to buy these snakes? We were the only people that, or Courtney was the only person who would, I'd ever known who'd actually like owned a ball python. So it was like a weird kind of eclectic animal. And I didn't think that there was that big of a market for it. And I thought that if Courtney started bre breeding these snakes, we would have a hundred snakes in our household and nobody would want them. And he had a good point because who was going to buy those snakes? Like we had no, no, I, at this point, I still didn't know about like reptile, reptile shows. I didn't really know about any ball python breeder except for Dynasty, Outback, and Barcheck because those were the ones that come up when you Google ball pythons for sale. Um, Morph Market was still foreign territory to me and I knew some people were posting pets on Craigslist and again, like the box pet stores, um, you don't buy pets on Craigslist. Eventually, after like three to six months or so of Courtney like talking about the snakes, having Amos, talking about breeding, I eventually was like, I wanna get my own as a pet. Still wasn't like into the idea of breeding at the time because I didn't know what we'd do with all the animals. So we are, Courtney's telling me about all the different combinations and he, she tells me about the blue-eyed leucistics, which is an all white snake with blue eyes. And at the time they were going for about four or $500 um, for a blue-eyed leucistic. And at, she found somebody on like a Facebook group or something like that, that was rehoming a blue-eyed leucistic male for $300. So the idea of it being like a $500 snake and we could get it for $300 and that's almost half off what they're worth was really, really cool and it was a beautiful snake. So we go to a, a Bojangles parking lot in Columbia, South Carolina and we buy um, the blue-eyed leucistic. You can see his blue eyes and his white skin. He's a little nervous, but he's not balling up, so he's not scared. And while we're there, this is like right as COVID's like just kicking off and everything. And as that's happening, they ask us if we're going to the Repticon that's happening there in Colombia in like the next weekend or the next weekend after that. And we didn't know anything about Repticon at the time. So we're just like, no, but that sounds pretty cool. So we like look into it, we get tickets and we end up going to the Repticon. And while we're at the Repticon, I think we buy like four or five other snakes while we're there. And at that point it's like, okay, let's let's do this breeding thing because there's so many different cool animals, but we'll do it on like, just like a hobby scale. We just want to pair some things up. We want to make like a clown and we want to make some Exanthics and maybe eventually way down the line, we can make an Exanthic clown. And that was like the first, I didn't know it at the time, but like project that I got really excited about was trying to make an exanthic clown. I posted pictures of our first snake, Amos, on Instagram. And I would always get a ton of likes on those pictures because back then my personal Instagram was public. Um, and uh, it, I was, I just thought it was popular, but I, I didn't realize how much attention um, ball python hashtags got. So I was getting a lot of uh, traction from this ball python hashtags. And I'm saying, normally I have like a hundred followers on my personal. So like <laughs> normally a picture of mine gets like 10 likes and these ball python pictures were getting like 50 likes. And I thought that was really interesting, really cool. So when I, when Steven and I decided we wanted to, um, like start, start breeding, one of the first things I wanted to do was start an Instagram and it was through Instagram that we found out about the entire reptile community. So I kind of get into ball pythons. I think my first breeding season was 2005 for ball pythons. Before that, I was into king snakes and some of those other things. But 2005, I think, was my first year actually producing a ball python baby. I bought a, a breeder male and bred to like five normal females. Back, back then, normal females were super expensive because everyone wanted to make these morphs. They go out and buy a codom male of some sort, and then they want to breed it to some normal females. So those were impossible to find. The thought process was 
generally speaking is that a morph would be found and you'd buy that mutation, you'd make more of them and sell them. And then we'd find another mutation, right? The value, would, the value of the mutation would drop as it was made, right? As more became available, more readily available. But then if you wanted to say, continue to work with high-end stuff, you had to go out and buy a new mutation. And then you just did it again, and did it again, and did it again. There was no stacking of the mutations back then. When I got in, it was more like, what morphs do you want to have? I wanted a clown, I want a pied, I got a lavender. And then it was around that same time that Kevin McCurley, a nerd, right, started making bumblebees. And that was the first time we kind of experienced like, oh, if you put this together, you make something different, right? And then their Lemon Blast was another early one. These are just simple mutations. That kind of captured my, my interest. And I think if I was to credit myself with, with something that kind of set me apart early on, was that I focused on combos when everybody else was focusing on making more of whatever specific mutation they'd found. Like nobody was playing in the long game back then, then except like guys like Justin and Ozzy and Miguel. Well, Miguel didn't even get into it until 2017 or 16. It wasn't until I moved back to New York when I was like, let's see what nerd's doing. And I went on nerd's page and they had bumblebees for like 65 grand. And then I, you know, I just looked at Donato and I was like, maybe we should do this on a small scale. And even if we put five grand a year away in a retirement fund, it would be fun, right? Chris and I grew up together and um, basically he was like, hey, you still got the snakes. I was breeding them out in California. You want to kind of get a couple of things and, and maybe start a breeding program. You know, he knew um, Tom Baker and he was like, you got to see this guy's house. He got this mansion and then he built a replica of the mansion for his dog. Central air conditioning and everything. I'm like, I don't even have central air conditioning in my house. And uh, and the dog had a house with central air conditioning. So I'm like, hell yeah, let's breed snakes. The people buying back then, we only had like, you know, a group of 500, let's say. But now you got a group of white trash that's like 50,000, you know, so you could sell, you could definitely sell better now. Back then, the community was, was much more fragmented. There's lots of people who love ball pythons, but because of the social media did not yet exist, we didn't really, we didn't have a lot of camaraderie, I would say back then. Most people would come to the shows and, and they would deal with each other online as if they were enemies, right, of whatever project they were trying to do. And they were trying to, most people were trying to hoard the information and they find out how to actually make a, um, how to breed a different species. Suddenly they were like, okay, we gotta hide this and use it for ourselves. It wasn't, it didn't, we didn't have that community aspect like we do now. Like it's, that, I think it's been fostered by social media mostly, or this idea that, yeah, we're all different people, but we have, we all like one specific thing, which is really unique. We all like that. So we have that together and um, it's, it's drawn us together over time, I think. The other thing that really changed, I think, is as the, especially in the ball python world, that's what I kind of speak to the best, right? Because I know the best, but the ball python world as, the industry became kind of mainstream in the sense that more and more lay people started wanting these snakes. There became a kind of an idea between different sellers and breeders that, hey, there's enough customers for us all. We don't have to hate each other in order to get ahead. We can just, there's plenty of people out there, plenty of fish in the sea, right? Before that, when I got in, there was, there was not plenty of fish in the sea. And everybody's like, I'm gonna sell my $30,000 snake before you sell yours because there's not two customers out there for that snake. And now there's definitely not two customers out there. It's really hard to stand out in the crowd if the crowd is massive, right? So for me, I didn't stand out in the crowd. Maybe professionalism a little bit because I always had kind of a slick look and I you know, had a marketing background myself. And so I always tried to like project myself well. That stood out a little bit. My uncle is a, a doctor and he invested in all these snakes initially for me because I was just coming out of college and had student loans like crazy, you know. And my uncle invested in the initial mutations for me. And when he went to his first show, he's a, he's a medical doctor, he walked around and he said, Justin, if you put on a collared shirt and have a good looking banner, you'll win in this business because almost nobody could do those two things, right? They were just people that were they were not professionals at all. They were just people who like snakes, right? And so, and they were asking for these huge sums of money from customers. And that's just a lot to ask for unless you put, you actually show an air of like, hey, I'm gonna here, I'm gonna be here five years from now. 
and you can trust me with these genetics. And so that's where I always felt like I had a little bit of an edge is I just, I understood that factor. And then I started making combos early on and I focused on working on those long-term projects. And when those animals started hatching, there was nobody else to compete with for those animals. And so it was kind of my, my own little market at that point. In every industry, right? The cream is gonna rise to the top and the, the shit people are gonna be left behind. So you guys are too young to, to remember like, there was maybe like 15 good 80s bands you know, like hair bands, like, you, you know, uh, Bon Jovi and Cinderella and all that. But there were a thousand bands trying to make it, you, you know, doing that same thing that just got left to the side because they weren't good enough or they didn't want to put the work in. So that, that's the same thing with uh, with this shit. Some people had a really a, a good kind of put together. And, and the major thing that other people had was there was several players in the market that we consider like titans of the market, you know. Brian Barczyk was pretty big back then. You had Ralph Davis and Steve Rusis and Snake Keeper and um, several I'm forgetting, you know, Peter Call. These are people that in our, in the ball python industry were those like the legends. In a way, they, they, they had a pretty good, you know, um, way of presenting themselves. But at the same time, they, uh, I don't know, they, there was also this, this kind of vibe like, we're cool and we don't want to seem too professional because we're snake breeders, mm -hmm. in a way, right? They're like, we're, we all, we all, it's it very insular at that point. Like, you're pretty much selling to your friends. There was no public. I mean, the, there was public. The public were coming in, they were buying the cheap, you know, captive hatchball pythons. All of us that were playing with the expensive stuff, it was just, you're selling to, your competitors, you're selling to your friends, you're selling to people that are really serious into it. And it was a very tight group. And so there, I think most people didn't feel like they had to present themselves a certain way, right? They just they just were, and it, you all know me, you know who I am, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of like, and to an extent we still have that in the industry. But as I think, as we more and more are going to the public, people are starting to think about more from business, business minded, like a standard business practice of you know, presenting yourself well. It's changed completely, the whole the whole vibe of it. Now I think most people are thinking long term on this. Back then too, what we always hear as you're spending money, people are like, are you sure this is gonna last, right? Because ball pythons were such a unique phenomenon. This, those kind of numbers were unheard of in the reptile world. And there was just this feeling that there's no indication that this is gonna last a long time. People didn't see the, the combo craze coming and that the, the, the there's also the understanding is that there's only so many people who are going to want to do these, so the prices can't can't stay steady. But as the market size grew, there became all this room for everybody to to be involved, and I think that's what's changed. It's become a, a much tighter community among the people who actually work with them, because there's no reason to to fight and you know kick each other down quite so much anymore, because the customers are the people that you want to present a nice you know present for, not not each other. <laughs> Well, we're two, three years now, post-COVID, right? Post uh, the, the onset of the pandemic. So now reality is kicking in. The reality is uh, it's a lot of work. And in order to profit off of this industry, right? Because I'm always talking about the difference between hobby and business. In order to do this as a business, the amount of work that has to go in and your return on investment, not just financially, but your sweat equity has to be immense. So your passion has to be huge in order to continue this. I think that now we're three years, and that's why I say I have a three year list. We're three years past the pandemic and people have just gotten bitten by the reality bug that they're nowhere close to what they thought they were gonna do uh, with the realities of this has to be your life. You have to live it, breathe it, eat it in order to even have any type of remote success. In my opinion, you gotta at least 
sort of like what you're going to look at. So if somebody comes at me with a question on where should I drop this X amount, thousands of dollars to get the highest return of investment, first of all, I think you're, you're doing it all wrong right there because there's a lot more work behind all this than, than what most people realize. Like anyone that's done this stuff knows there's the snake care and if you're doing any kind of social media like this whole, whole this thing is like so time consuming to to get established that you need to at least like the animals you're working with and that like that's projects and species there's a lot that goes into taking care of this number of animals like you want to obviously check on them all the time because you don't you don't want something to have happened to an animal and you don't check on it for two or three days like that's all like so you're constantly checking on your animals you're constantly checking your temps your water you have to also if you're you know growing your own rodents you have to do rodent care every single day um they are a lot of work as well plus promoting on um like all of your marketing promoting on social media if you want to grow your social media account you really have to be liking other people's posts commenting posting on your own story posting your own posts your own reels so you're uh, doing a lot of content um, it, it's a full-time job even when it's just a hobby i think ralph davis or the racist said the only way to become a millionaire with ball pythons is to start with two million right and invest a million and when you lose it you still have a million so and that's probably true i mean because we we invested close to or over you know a quarter of a million dollars and where that shit is gone now most people come to me and say i want to buy this snake i saw it more frog that's great it's an easy easy transaction but most people come to me i would say most people a lot of people come to me and say justin what should i do and here's and my first question is what are your goals right some people they just want to have a really fun father-son project, you know, where they make it the morph that their son saw on YouTube, and that's that's it, you know, and that's, that's all it is. Um, some people want to get into it as a hobby where they have a dozen snakes in their basement, and they go down there and they enjoy them, and they try to, they try to meet some goals. Other people want to make money, right? Um, those are the people that usually don't last as well, honestly, long term. If they, if they come in and their goal is Oh yeah, I like snakes, but, he's making, but the money is the goal. Then, and this, generally speaking, the time it takes and the effort it takes to get there is too long for their interest will run out before the money comes. The amount of snakes that you would have to sell um, to replace your income plus what this brings in, because <sighs> this is going into a lot, but if you wanted to go into this full time, you to not have any change in like, like any lifestyle change you would have to not only make your own salary but also the amount you were already bringing in with the extra ball python income um because you're used to that extra ball python income and you're used to spending that money on snakes if this is something that you're doing for sole profit most people don't understand the scale you have to take it to in order for you to make a living off of this and for it to be successful. Those genes that you invested in are no longer the same value as when you purchase them and they're just getting to size where you can start pairing and, and ha having hatchlings come from those genes where you thought you were going to break the bank. Somebody competing with you has eight of them and 16 grand to that guy would be amazing. So he's going to put it out to, for two grand, okay? If he has eight of them, that changes the market for him because there's very few people that are going to buy into that project. And so the next people are going to go down to 1100 And then the next people are going to go down to 700 Most people get in, they get in a little bit over their head and they want to scale back at least some after a couple of years. And there's a couple of reasons why. I would say, kind of a laundry list, but one would be, Initially they get in, they don't understand the industry that well, or they don't understand what the goals and factors are. So they get in and they typically will buy a bunch of animals that they wish they didn't have in a couple of years. It's not a really good foundation. Really common. If they, could, if they can retool after that stage, they usually have a lot of success. But a lot of times after that first one, they just a little, uh, you know what I'm saying? They get nervous by doing it, messing up again, 
it. We were guilty too. Uh, buying too many things that aren't worthwhile. So, you know, getting, you know, five or 10, you know, big snakes that are single gene, sort of outdated stuff. And, uh, uh, and then they don't really have a plan. They're like, I got a bunch of big breeders and then I'm gonna find something else cheap to put the, to them all. They wind up with a hundred babies and not being able to sell anything. I think that's the biggest, biggest problem because you gotta feed those hundred babies and nobody wants them. Second thing that happens is, and this is actually probably the most common, is just their lives change. People think that their life are gonna be the same in three years as it is now and most people's lives change quite a bit in three to five years, you know, and they may, they may get married, they may have kids, their financial situation might change, they may want to move overseas with their job, like there's so many things that, that end up being a factor, like ah, we just don't want to have a steady lifestyle built around animals anymore. Animals really tie you down, you know, when it comes, when it comes to animal care. You, you got to put in the work, but the work nowadays is so much more than what we had to put in. Because now you have to do social media, you have to do Instagram, you have to do YouTube, you have to do all this. But if you don't want to create something and have like an idea of what you want to create and what you want to see and something that you're excited about and passionate about, it's not going to be fun for you and you're not going to last in it because there's a lot of waiting in ball pythons. There's a lot of, um, just a lot of waiting and if you don't have something to look forward to why are you gonna you know do that because if the thing you're looking forward to is making money then there's nothing for you to look forward to I, I i don't have an issue with someone doing it in a spare bedroom it's it's the beginning and that's where you can actually if you're looking at having this and having financial gain is where you can start the process in making the animals and in acquiring the ingredients you're gonna need for that recipe for success, which takes time. Uh, you, can, you can jump the gun. There's people that have shown that formula works when you invest big money and you make big money items. But those that have succeeded in that have also had huge business sense that they brought to the table that they had prior to the ball python world that in combination they were able to utilize that experience and just replace the product with ball pythons. Because if you had a high-end animal, okay, that values at, and it happens, $20,000, $30,000, but I have no inclination of who you are. Why would I buy that animal from? So a huge aspect of doing this as a professional is doing this as someone that this is your main stream of revenue, you have to have business sense, you have to have marketing sense, you have to know how to utilize uh, social media. Um, if you don't know acronyms like KPI, if you don't know what an ROI is, um, yeah, this you're not running it like a business. You're just like any other backyard breeder that took a closet, took a spare bedroom, got a few animals and it's a hope and a dream. You're not going to hit the lot of them. You have a better chance of playing a lot. When you get in, like, just think about, are you going to be doing this, you know, a long time from now? Do you, are you, most people, they get, get a level of success around the five-year mark, but most people don't quite make it to that. And it's not necessarily, not necessarily because they're not interested, but, you know, things happen. Well, I think it's very similar to any kind of, like, investment or an investment company, investment bit. Like, if you open a restaurant, like, you don't expect to just sit down and rake in the money like you have to put in the advertising you have to put in the work you have to build up a client customer base you have to build up some regulars you have to come in every day and you know actually do the work um, unless you're just building a franchise or something it takes effort um, and i do think some people think of it as like building a franchise rather than building from the ground up um, where they see somebody who's making a lot of money and they think, oh, if all you have to do is pair two snakes together, I can do that. And it's, that's kind of like saying like, oh, all you have to do is sell some food, I can do that. But it's, there's so much more that goes into it. Um, and the people who don't realize how much goes into it and think they're just going to make money, obviously don't last because they're not making any money and they, it out of it. I would say if your goal is to do it as a full-time job, you're probably putting the cart before the horse. 
um, because I never even saw it that way when I started. And it took me about seven to eight years, I would say, from when I started to when I was able to turn into a full job job. But all through that time, I saw it as, this is what I enjoy doing, I make a little extra money for the family maybe, but it wasn't like with that goal. Now, can you turn, can you come in and make it that, the goal from the beginning? Probably, but I don't know, there's just so many variables, right? That I have a hard time saying like, oh yeah, here's the steps to do that. Like, I don't know, like I'll, you have to have, I say this a lot with, pe with people and they say, what does it take to run a ball python, python business? What are, the, what are the steps, what do I need to do? And the answer to this is, I think the answer to any business is, you need to become the kind of person that would run a ball python business successfully. It's not what animals you buy, or what rack system you, you get or whatever. So I'm on Patreon, I try to give like advice on all of those things. But in the end, they say nine out of 10 businesses fail, right, in the first five years. I think it's because nine out of 10 people are not the kind of people it takes to run a business. Probably all those businesses that failed were legitimate businesses that somebody else could have succeeded in, right? But that just wasn't who they were. They didn't have that right skill set or they didn't have, um, again, it's the kind of person. Like, so you probably won't come in with the right skill set. But I had this attitude from the beginning when I got in, it's like, well, what do I need to do and who do I need to be to be the kind of person who would succeed at this? Right, and so I was extremely introverted, extremely quiet, extremely, I learned how to not be that way because the business required that of me. Most people, when they come to that requirement, they think, I'm not sure I want to do this that bad. That's the difference maker in my opinion of who succeeds and who doesn't. During the first season of 15 Minutes of Lame, I'm pretty sure, um, I really didn't kind of understand how it worked at first, and I really didn't feel like I'll have myself out there enough to kind of get into it. So I decided to kind of just kind of play the back and kind of see how that whole thing goes, you know? So I watched Shane, I knew who Shane was. We literally lived like an hour and a half from each other. I met Shane before the whole contest. Um, I knew who John Feely was. I knew who Corey Martin was and things like that. So I was like, I just played the game where I knew that first season the odds wouldn't be in my favor enough and I had more work. At the end of the year, you compete against the other people that have been a 15 minutes of lame guest on this podcast to get your own highlighted segment, your whole, your own episode. So it's like, I always put it this way, it's like being the opening act versus being like Guns N' Roses, you know? It's like, this is your chance to, to validate yourself and prove that you're worthy of having your own episode of Snakes and the Fat Man and cementing your legacy in the reptile industry. Snakes and the Fat Man show, like, as soon as I listen to it, there's like other connections I already had with him, Mu like music. I'm really, really into music. We like similar stuff, so I already felt like a, a brotherhood because he's a fellow rock and roll type person, you know? And uh, so when he was starting to come back, of course, I was happy to, to have some uh, podcasts to listen to too. We happened to be in the same Zoom call together through Brian Cusco, and one of the people that were in there were like, hey Chris, this is Shane, you should have him on 15 Minutes of Lame, and it just started there. I was towards the end of the year, I think I was November, so there was already you know like 10 out before me or something like that, you know? And I remember like he was giving those people a hard time and I know it was all in like in fun and jest or whatever. And that interview with me, it was different. I pushed back a little bit at some point or something. I don't know, I haven't listened to it in a while. But then when it was done and it was out, people were like, well, he treated you totally different and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, man, what happened? But, and then, uh, then when the contest happened, I don't know what the intention of the contest was that first year. I know that it was to get your own episode. I know there was a goal in mind, but I don't know what Chris's, uh, I, didn't, I don't know what Chris's vision was, you know? I was a contestant, so he wasn't gonna share that with me at that time, you know? It's like, I don't know if the original year was supposed to be taken seriously or if it was another like parody or a joke, but like, I went into it like, man, I gotta win, there's, Absolutely no way I'm gonna lose. I'm taking this to the extreme. 
I f stopped focusing all everything I was doing at the time and I just focused in on the contest. What's up, YouTube? Hello. Ha! I'll show the wrist of clips here in just a second, but we're going to DT Cypher's hit. The year I competed, the first year, there was a vote on the website and everyone only could have one vote according to your email address. So you might be able to sneak a couple other votes in there. So the, the goal was to get uh, accumulate as many votes for yourself as you could. And it was like a 30 day window or something. And uh, so yeah, I went on a campaign and uh, like everywhere. I was mentioning it through my YouTube channel. Man, I pounded the ground on Facebook, even though I don't do Facebook. I mean, I was going to like, my local hometown Facebook knitting groups, like everyone like from where I'm from and like even those people were like, Shane's from Santa Paula, go cast him a vote like on their pages and stuff. So there was like the hometown crowd, the reptile crowds that I was, uh, I was filming videos like I was actually out on campaign cause I was still touring and visiting other reptile breeders. So like I, I was at the Parthenon in Nashville acting like I was in Greece, like, you know, I was acting one day I might be a politician, you know, doing an ad campaign and stuff. Like I was trying to bring, like having fun, bring a little bit of comedy, make it seem like I was traveling the world, you know, just spice it up, you know, instead of just like a daily post, like, hey, don't forget to vote. You know, like I was trying to just do everything I could to make noise, get noticed, win over votes. I told myself, I'm winning the next one. I t as soon as it was announced, I'm like, I'm definitely winning the next one, 100%. So once I found out about the open Zoom calls, so Snakes and the Fat Man, I got on those, got in the Zoom calls, showed my face up there. Um, you know, everybody, people knew I was a veteran and stuff too. And uh, he invited me to come on in the 15 minutes. And the second year, I purposely stayed back from it. I didn't want to influence anyone. Like, I had the title or whatever, you know? So I, I didn't want to influence anyone's opinions of that year's contestants. Uh, one that stood out for me though was uh, Ron did a good job from BBM. Antoine, of course, Antoine did a good job. He's the one that won the second year. Alyssa from Full Throttle did a good job. Those were some of the standouts to me of that year. Looking back, it's been a while now, but uh, yeah, that, that, that contestant year, that was before Chris brought brought in any of the judges. And so I didn't personally like endorse or help anyone campaign. I just stayed totally back and let everyone do their own thing. I went back and watched every single 15 minutes of laying video for the beginning. And I was like, they suck, they suck, they suck, they suck, they suck. Everyone's doing the same response. Everybody was like, well, what makes me special is that I care for my animals. We all care for our animals for the most part. You know, and you're gonna get a quality animal from me. That's what everybody says. So I think I went with the whole shtick when I was like, yeah, you know, I got a compound at the house and if you buy an animal from me, you get to get put on the list for the, for the world is, <laughs> you know? So I kind of was playful along there, just kind of, just you know, just being different. I was hoping during that campaign that I had a lot of people doing more of like a smear campaign so I could like, people would like target me so I could go back and forth with, but the one guy who did all the smear campaign only had like 20 followers. So I was like, if I post him, that's gonna give him more traction, <laughs> you know? I just wish my biggest regret is that I didn't have a bunch of other people that I saw as a threat. Like I honestly was just like, I'm gonna smoke everybody's boots in this and it's not even gonna be close. And then we had like the Canada Gate thing going <laughs> where they were like, dude, when they were cheating and cheating the algorithm and cheating something to get the votes, I was still hundreds of votes ahead of the people that they were being cheated with. Every year there's a little bit of shady something or other from somebody in the contestant group. So every year Chris has changed it for various little reasons and uh, so my year, somebody was trying to buy votes. Chris changed it. I think that second year was like, you could vote once a day. Cause I remember voting multiple times that year. As far as that aspect go, I did the work. So like, I went through my whole entire phone list, my contact lists, and went on my uh, 
my computer like a mass text and said, hey, vote for me, click here every day. You can click here again, you can click here again and just, you know, just kept it busy like that, posting on Facebook and didn't have to do as many videos. I made a little couple of reels, picking with some people, but that was it, man. But I just stayed on top of it and got the votes that way. And I let a lot of people know, I was like, hey, this is really important to me. I think this is gonna bring me to the next level as a breeder and get my face out there as far as social media goes and my business, so do it. So not only did I have reptile breeders behind me, I had the martial arts community behind me, like I had UFC fighters voting for me, um, I had the Marine Corps veterans. The Marine Corps veterans page is 200,000 200, members on that Facebook page. People were voting for me every day on there. I kept mentioning, hey, devil dog, we voted for you again, man. Kick ass. Oh, my too. So I did that, you know. So just every other niche group I was in, I just crossed that information over and everybody was behind me, man. And it, and it worked. I had I had Facebook events, like multiple Facebook events. Like it would be like noon, time to vote for Antoine in 15 minutes of lane. And people would vote in the group. They comment voted and stuff too. So it was just, it was out of big support system, man. And that's what helped me kick butt through that. So. I was I was proud and grateful that the tradition was being carried on that it was taken seriously. So that like holds the importance of that of that contestant like that that prize, you know. Like I think it, it should always be fun, but it's also like a level of achievement that you can't buy it. I mean, it's like you got to win over the crowd, the judges, whoever, whatever's happening that year. You can't just go in and buy it and think that you're going to win or whatever. So Antoine did a great job and he set the bar up there too and I think it's important for every year that goes on to at least stay at that bar or raise the bar. I always knew that there could be some like last minute jump or something could have happened too, you know what I mean? So I didn't always like know from the beginning I was going with, I know that was the goal. Like when I, when I said, okay, I'm going to be in this season of 15 minutes of lane, I already had stuff prepared. I was like, okay. This, every time I saw a new video pop up, oh, this is my new competition, okay, so I'll take notes, okay. They do this, they do that, and I listen to the video and I'll be like, okay, draw a line through them, no competition at all. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this guy, I might have to worry about this guy, and then somebody pop up, yeah, threat number one, you know, so I had like my, my threat hierarchy, and honestly, I think I only had to worry about maybe three or four people instead of like the whole what twelve or whatever it was too, and I just figured as long as I can as long as I can smoke their boots and knock them out of the water, I, I'd be good. So, um, and then when I when it got announced, I was overjoyed and I did the whole podcast and it was just such a good time, man. And that's probably one of my favorite accomplishments as like being in the hobby too, man. I, it will always be up there. So in the third year, uh, there was still the crowd votes. There was still like a campaign period, roughly a month, and uh, but there was also the addition of judges. And that was because year two, there was somebody with bots doing multiple votes. So yeah, so that ruined year two on, on the uh, legitimacy of some of those votes. So by year three, you had the crowd portion accounted for 25%. And then you had three judges, and that made up 25% apiece for 100%. And I was invited to be one of those judges. So with him adding the judges, um, I think what is that? We had like a certain percentage of like the vote and stuff too. And um, was it was it like 50% of them? I don't remember what the percentage of the vote. Each judge had 25, and the yeah. popular vote was 25. Yeah, something like that too. So. Um, I just think that every year it's been growing and this adding this other element to it where it just wasn't um, someone pressing the button and you trying to beat the algorithm, you know what I mean? So I think, honestly, I think this time it was more valuable because you had to get more people involved. I had to justify my answer and stuff like that. I don't that remember too. it word for word or specifically, but he bounced the idea off me and I said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, it helps el eliminate any kind of uh, cheating that may try to happen. And it allows like me and Antoine to kind of like keep the bar high too. Cause like you gotta meet, we're two different people and you got, so you gotta meet his expectations and my expectations. And then uh, Donato, uh, he was part of eyeballs and he was around during the whole snakes and the fat man inception. So there's a tradition for him too, to be a judge. and. Uh, 
Yeah, man, I, I thought that was a good idea. So it still enables people to go out there and put the work. I personally, as a judge, did look at the votes too as part of the, the options I was weighing, you know? I looked at the popular vote. I looked at what they're currently doing in the hobby. Not, I mean, project-wise and stuff too, but are they at a level where I think they're taking it serious and, you know, they don't just have two snakes and a huge social media following. And I spoke with Chris and asked him who all was actually going to compete because some people didn't even want to compete and they, you know, whatever, they opted out of the whole thing. So then I got that list of the people who weren't even competing and I went back through and I listened to every 15 minutes of lane for that year and their original interview was part of what I was weighing in it too. Like, did they do a good job? Would I want to hear more from them? Or was it like, you know, five minutes of silence and just, yeah, uh, no, no, you know. So I weighed in all that. And then how much work they were putting in, like for the campaign and was their campaign successful in my opinion. Uh, there was people doing like podcast appearances. There was some people doing reels and shorts and stuff like that. So I, I considered all those like equal. What appealed to me was uh, some of the comedy short skits and stuff on the reels on Instagram and consistency though, like not just one, I mean like consistency. So that, those were all the things I was weighing in. I also thought about who was gonna be here five years from now. There's a lot of people, there's people back in season one, haven't heard from them. My season aren't doing anything too. So. I didn't want someone to just jump in, take this title, run with it, and then disappear. You know, there's there's a lot of breeders that I legit respected during like the COVID era when they got stuff in and they did everything right. Book cool animals had great marketing, had dope logos and stuff too. And then all of a sudden, nowhere to be found. So um, I, my choice, my three were going to be the people that I thought were still going to be around for a long time because I know they invested the time, money, and effort into this too. So. I wanted us to be on 15 Minutes of Lame, and I told Steven, <laughs> I want, we, we do this little, these little business meetings is what we call them, but we came up with goals uh, like for 2022, and my goal was to be on 15 Minutes of Lame, and it was like, oh, how are we going to do that? Um, and it was essentially, I don't know like how to say it, but it essentially like slide into Chris's DMs, start chatting him up, like follow him on Patreon show up to the Zoom calls, be like, be like, put our face out there, start like associating face and a name. And then like at some point, maybe you'd be like, hey, I think you should be on 15 Minutes Live. It was way easier than I expected because all I had to do was show up to one Zoom call. And he was like, hey, you should be on 15 Minutes of Live. Yeah. I, I, I actually was like, this is a hot chick with big boobs. I want her on more, I gotta get her. I gotta get her a shirt. You guys have been making waves for probably the last eight or 10 months just based on your socials. And so I was already gonna ask you to come on regardless if uh, Courtney had giant yams or not. All right, everybody. I have the winner of 15 Minutes of Lane 2021 here. Antoine Hood, High Desert Python. What's up, brother? What's happening, bro? I, I saw Antoine's on, full length video. Like I saw where he had already won the contest. I wasn't really aware of the contest in 2021. So what I thought was whoever had the best interview won the contest. Um, everyone would vote based off of who had the best interview. And because our internet kept cutting out and that stressed me out, um, I don't know how Steven felt about it, but because of that, I didn't feel like our interview was going to be the best. I didn't feel like it was by any means like the funniest. I didn't feel like um, it was the smoothest because of all those cutouts. So it was kind of like, okay, we did it. We did the thing. That's done. <laughs> and it got closer and closer to like the November time frame, And that's when Chris was like, hey, get ready to start campaigning. This is how long the voting's gonna be open. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to share his posts on our story for a month, <laughs> you know? Cause I, that's what I thought campaigning was. I thought it was like saying, oh, by the way, go vote. And maybe that is what it was for a lot of people. Um, but a couple days before voting opened, Steven was like, hey, I wanna go all out. 
and I want to legitimately campaign. And I've got a couple ideas. Fellow Americans, Australians, Canadians, we are Leviathan Snakes, and we are announcing our candidacy in the 2022 Snakes and the Fat Man 15 Minutes of Lame contest. So the political, like the political ad style campaign, that was Steven's idea, and I was hesitant at first for a couple reasons. The first thing was it was a little out of my comfort zone. I, like we show the animals more often than we show ourselves, and it sounded very much like, oh, it would be us in front of a camera. And I was like, nobody's here to look at us. They're here to look at the animals. And like, who's gonna watch it for more than a second? It, which is just negative on my part. But the second thing was like, Steven's ideas, while funny, we do have slightly different senses of humor. And I, found, I felt like a lot of his jokes were a little too on the nose. If you elect Leviathan Snakes as the 2022 Snakes and the Fat Man class of lame president, we will abolish the thousand gram law. A vote for Leviathan Snakes is a vote for friendship, for community, for victory, for- oh God, stop. We intend to bridge the gap between mammal owners and reptile keepers. Bird owners can take a hike. Steven would be like, oh, I've got a great idea. What if a vote for Leviathan Snakes is a vote to abolish the thousand gram law? And I'm like, that is funny, but how about while you're doing that, I'm saying like, we can't do that, what are you talking about? What if we have a straight man in those jokes and we're not just being, both of us being ridiculous? I will say we were both ridiculous. If you vote Leviathan Snakes as the lamest reptile breeder of 2022, we promise to be completely transparent about all tax transactions. In fact, we will actually take your taxes and donate all of them to High Desert Pythons so Antoine can finally shut down his OnlyFans account. You have to stop sucking them. Leviathan Snakes is dedicated to helping those in need. That's why, with the help of our deep-pocketed and kind-hearted supporters, we have been able to raise over $7 to Donato's Dream Fund. That's over halfway to our goal of $13.50, including shipping and handling. Steven would come in and he would make, like, a joke. And then I would play the straight man, like, interrupting him, telling him to stop being goofy. And what happened very quickly is a lot of people were like, wow, Courtney's a real bitch. <laughs> Courtney's just mean, okay? I mean, she's literally just mean. Like, like Courtney will go out of her way to insult you. <laughs> we'll be like, yeah, you you shut him down so fast, you must be a pro at that. You must silence him all the time. And if you look at like our outtakes, it would be like me, Steven being like, no, you have to interrupt me before I'm finished. You keep stopping me after I've already finished. Like you have to actually interrupt me. Actually, um, can we do that? And when I start saying the last one, um, as soon as I oh, start- Oh, you don't want saying, me to do that? No, I do want you to do it, but I want you to do it as soon as I say like Canadians, like as the very last one, just kind of hold your hand up. Like as soon as I start saying it. Okay. So a lot of our, a lot of things that we talked about, we would come up with the idea, we'd kind of run it past each other, we'd make some changes and be like, okay, this is our joke. And then we'd get in front of a camera and it would change again because it just didn't flow um, unless we changed a certain way. So, you know, the I think the first one that I, people really laughed at was um, that we were going to be completely transparent with all of our tax transactions. And it was supposed to be something along the lines of like uh, spending the money to shut down Antoine's OnlyFans. And I think in the moment, it was like in the in the moment of recording, I decided to be like, no, don't do that. You know, it, it, a lot of them changed as we recorded them because maybe it just didn't look right. And what if we change this a little bit? We're gonna be running the um, 15 minutes of lame contest for 2022. So I'm gonna have a voting system set up on the. Uh, snakesandafatman.com website for that and um you know I, I just hope hope you guys vote i mean it's going to account for 25 percent of the voting voting the uh the online stuff and then uh get split up between donato Shane. so this year something that they did different is they had the popular vote was worth 25 percent of all of the contest 
and then Donato, Antoine, and Shane each held like a judge's vote and each of those votes counted for 25%. So, you know, 25% popular vote, Shane's vote, Donato's vote, Antoine's vote. That's how you got the 100%. And if there were there was a tie, Chris was gonna have a tiebreaker. That meant that we had to get at least two of those things. We either had to get two judge votes, we had to get a judge judge's vote and a popular vote. We couldn't just rely on the popular vote. So, you know, we wanted people to vote for us. And we were definitely putting out videos and like making ourselves known and getting and promoting all of our like friends and family to vote for us. Um, but after a couple of days, uh, Reggie's, Ur Reggie's Urban Jungle and ASM Royals pulled so far ahead that for us to catch up and pull ahead, you know, we, we didn't know how many votes there were total, but it, it seemed like we would have to get like hundreds of votes within a day or like a thousand votes within a day. and maintain that for the rest of the contest and we kind of knew that if we were going to do that we would have to focus all of our energy on that popular vote and there were three judges votes and we needed at least one judges vote along with the popular vote so what we decided was to while still staying at least in third third or fourth place we decided that we needed to really focus on the judges After we recorded the kidnapping video with Shane and Chris, we were also there with Bree from Smoky Mountain Balls, and we weren't exactly sure what we wanted to do. We just knew we wanted to record a video with her, and we kept talking about like a fight, like we were gonna fight. So it was gonna be like panning to her, panning to me, and then we were gonna like duke it out. So we got the clips of like her and I looking at each other um but we weren't sure what we were going to do with it we didn't really know where to go from there it was all the comments on the kidnapping videos that um made me think of oh i'm going to take a snake bag and i'm going to put it over the camera and it'll look like i kidnapped her we did the kidnapping with chris and shane we did the kidnapping with brie we did the kidnapping with andrew and then it was like right at the end of the contest and we needed another video and that's when we called brian and we did our last like kidnapping video and i feel like the kidnapping ones that was kind of like a talking point like that kept people talking about us that was really a funny unique thing my favorite that we did was the bowl of spaghetti How did you think of the pictures replacing all the pictures? Oh my god, that I forgot about that one. Oh, I forgot about the scrapbook. That was just me being fucking hilarious. That was just me in a stroke of genius. I don't care. I take back the bowl of spaghetti being my favorite. The scrapbook was my favorite. I, I was like working. I, I was working from home that day and I got the idea of like sucking up to the judges. I was like, we gotta pander to the judges. How are we gonna do that? And I, I don't know what it was, but I think I had gotten, I had gotten a new job fairly recently and I had just put up pictures around my workspace of like family members. And I was like, oh my God, it would be so funny if like, they were pictures of the judges, you know? Like if I was like showing them like, and I even have pictures of you. So I, I added everyone on Facebook and I started stalking their Facebooks to find the best pictures I could of them. And I, like, the same day printed them all off at CVS and I um, put them up around the house. So I used to do this to my mom anytime I'd like house sit for my mom. I would like replace all of the pictures in the house of just me and so like that's kind of where that's kind of where the idea came from was like replacing all the pictures in the house of like the judges and I like made a whole scrapbook page and Steven I feel like you weren't quite on board with it I feel like you were like why are you doing this, this is so stupid but I had him I, I was like in a feverish like 
date trying to record myself because so he gets home from work and I'm like standing on the bed and I've got pictures of Antoine and Shane and Donato and Chris like scattered around the room and like a tripod and a ring light and I'm like I can't get the angle right and that's when I had him record um that's when I had him record it instead of like try to do the tripod and we did it the first time and I'm like no 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 you didn't get me like throwing the picture of my loved ones away. You need the picture of me flinging them behind me, not just hanging up the new one. So we re-recorded it. That was a good one. After 16,000 votes online, So they're announcing the winner on Christmas day. So obviously we wake up in the morning and Santa came and the kids are opening the presents. It's the baby's first Christmas and Steven doesn't care about any of that. He wants to know who won the 15 minutes of lame contest. And he says, move out of the way, kids. We're watching TV. What's up, guys? And Merry Day Little Baby Jesus was born. After six weeks, I know that certain people are just exhausted of this contest. And by the constant parade of IG and Facebook posts all over your time. I think they announced it around noon. So Steven was setting up a camera to like record our reactions and like somebody knocks on the door and we're not expecting anyone. And we're like, we get a lot of solicitors. You know, we work from home a lot. So we notice when the solicitor comes up to the house and Steven's like, who the heck is trying to sell us something on Christmas day? And we open the door and my parents are there wearing Christmas light dress and a christmas light suit and, a, and they've got wassail and they start christmas caroling and we were not expecting them to come at all it was so cute it was so adorable it was so sweet and we were like steven's like that was great we're watching tv though and they were like oh we'll watch it with you we'll find out if you guys won together and my mom's like i'll watch the baby people like reggie Bree, andrew steven gordon patrick chung we Jana. Uh, then they really turned up the competition this year, and I appreciate all of the insane hard work that you guys put into this. Hell, I even appreciate the contestants that put minimal work into this. I definitely want to give thanks to all of you guys who voted every day for your favorites. You guys have really made it fun, and I want to thank everybody that shared reels, that shared Facebook posts. I, I mean, hell. Some people were doing the reels, and they weren't even in the contest. So, really. Thank you to all of you guys who voted. All right, let's just get to it. On the popular vote, the- Popular vote was like an easy of who won it because we all knew who was ahead because we were like, you could see who was ahead when you voted. We had 16,000 votes and it was a fucking nail biter right up to the end. And Jana King of ASM Royal Tales edged out Reggie Johnson of Reggie's Urban Jungle by just 200 votes. 16,000 votes, and she won by just 200 votes. And she won by just 200 so votes. So Jana has 25%. Congratulations, Jana. So we knew that really. Jana from ASM was gonna win the popular vote. So that announcement was made, um, and she did. She won the popular vote. So we think that Jana or Reggie is going to win the popular vote, and our hope is that the three judges, at least two of them voted. My dad, he drives, he drives trucks. So um, he, you, you don't see him as often. He's on the road a lot and it, you don't get to like communicate a lot of the stuff with him as well. He's not on social media. So he hadn't like, he, the only videos he had seen that we put out were like ones that we screen recorded and texted to him. And then he watched in like a pixelated form. So what was funny about that is he had seen the video where we mail our like blackmail and bribe and bowl of spaghetti. First judge up is Donato Senor from Blind Mice Reptiles. Hey guys, just want to thank everybody for participating in the contest. You really made it a lot of fun for us these last couple of weeks. You made it a really tough choice to pick a winner. You were all great. Um, but only one of you really, really got to my heart. So I just want to say thank you to yes! Kevin and Steven yes! for this beautiful Christmas present. Yes! Leviathan Snakes, you're my winner. Merry Christmas.
Okay, Leviathan Snake's hopping on the board with 25%. So when Donato pulls the bowl of the like bowl of spaghetti out of the box that looks exactly like the box in the video, my dad was like, did you actually mail that man a bowl of spaghetti? And I was like, yes, dad, and it stayed pristine. I really, really got a kick out of the pasta thing. I've talked to other people, and a lot of people that I talked to, they noticed the present right away, and I didn't notice it until he like, right beforehand, right before he like reached into it and pulled out the bowl of spaghetti. And as soon as I noticed it, that's when I knew that he was gonna vote for us. But I, I, I felt like we had pandered to him appropriately. Um, like his type of humor, I feel like he probably would have, had we not done that, I think he probably would have voted for Andrew because I think he thinks Andrew is really funny. Um, oh, well, I don't just think that. I've heard him say Andrew is really funny. So when he asked me to be a judge, I'm like, okay. I literally went back and re-listened, and I went backwards, and uh, I re-listened to every 15 minutes. This way I could give everybody a fair shot. I wrote everyone's name down, what I liked, what I didn't, and, and right out of the gate, I loved Andrew. I was like, this dude right here, I would literally call him up and, and go out drinking with him tonight. Like, I loved him right out of, in, just based off of the um, the interview itself. And, and not that he didn't do a lot, um, you know, during the contest, but to me, there was nobody even close to him just based off of the podcast. <clears throat> and then the videos got me to like other people just as much, you, you know, and then obviously I like him a little more as far as just doing more. So I think the, the, the videos make a big difference, honestly. Ladies and gentlemen, we are tied right now. Now, let's keep this thing moving because I know a lot of you parents out there have to go pretend that you like that shit. Crooked, fucking, cracked-ass, fucking love that your fucking stupid kids made you for Christmas. You love that right. mom. <laughs> we have Antoine Hood from High Desert Pythons. All right, guys, this is my 18th take you in the video because Chris said I had to make it under two minutes. So this is Antoine from High Desert Pythons in 2022. 15 minutes of lame winner, the lamest of the lame, and I'm happy to pass my torch on to the next class for 2023. One was quality of animals in your projects, because first of all, we're in the business of, in the hobby of selling and producing animals. So if you got some quality animals or some real dope cutting edge projects, or you got something in the future that you're building on, you got my attention. Number two, your social media presence before and during this campaign. So who do I know beforehand because of your social media? Who do I, and where do I see you at now? And your improvements for putting yourself out there. Number three, creative campaign videos. A lot of you kill me with the reels, especially on Instagram and YouTube and get yourself out there. So who the fuck you? Um, number four, somebody I actually wanted to listen to for an hour and a half to two hours. And I know, you know, it was hard to get yourselves out there, some of you, but the ones who got on different people's podcasts and made some noise, I was able to kind of sit there and see what you were about. You know, some of you did excellent on those podcasts and some not too good. So I already had some people I wanted to scratch off from that. And number five, who was going to take the mantle from me and take that torch and run along with it and kill it for not even 2023, but above and beyond that. It has some dope animals out there, an asset to the reptile community, and somebody to go to for the next generation to come along and look up to and ask questions about their animals and their social media and their husbandry and things like that too. So, without further ado, out of all of you, my pick for the 2023 class for the 15 minutes of lane is Andrew Lyons from Rebel the Reptiles. Andrew Lyons from Rebel the Reptiles. All right, all right, all right. All right. This is getting exciting. Andrew Lyons from Redwood Reptiles is hopping on the board with 25%. We have a legitimate three-way tie right now. So Antoine, he gave his list of reasons for why he chose who he chose, and he chose Andrew from Redwood Reptiles. I think that's a solid vote. I think Andrew um, is an awesome breeder. He's got awesome projects. He's funny. He had a really good interview, very like, um, his. he probably had one of the more entertaining 15 minutes of lame interviews so that was like pretty solid for him um so yeah i think that was that vote made uh total sense to me obviously i'm disappointed because i want to win and i want everyone to vote for me but you know uh solid vote man it's all up to shane right now of small town exotics if he votes for one of the three contestants on the board right now then they will be crowned 
the 2022 15 minutes of lane winner. If he names somebody else, then there's gonna be a tie and I'm gonna have to bother Justin on Christmas to get his vote for the tiebreaker. Shane. So the final one was Shane and we were kind of on the edge of our seats because, you know, again, we tried really hard to like earn everybody's votes and sort of pander and be silly and make people like, um, want to like us but i also felt like shane of all of the judges was the most like i don't want to say strict but like he made it very clear that like he respected the title and he was going to vote for the person that he genuinely felt like should earn it so it was like yeah we may have been silly and made him laugh but is he gonna vote for us like or ha does he feel like somebody else deserves it more kind of deal um, so it was definitely like, I was on the edge of my seat. What's up voters, <laughs> what's up flamers? Today I'm gonna give you my top five as a judge, the way I ranked everyone. Number five, Dragon Soul Reptiles. Number four and number three are pretty neck and neck with me. So I'm gonna give that to Reggie's Urban Jungle and Redwood Reptiles. Number two and number one, before I get to the big announcement though, Big shout out and honorable mention to Tag Reptiles for getting the snakes in the fat man tattoo. And the number one and the number two spots, man, it was really close, really neck and neck. It was really close, really neck and neck. I'm gonna have to give the edge to Leviathan. Yes! Uh, yes! Janet, yes! you did a great job. ASM Royal Tells, great job. I would rank you at number two. I'm giving the edge to Leviathan. Yes! Yes. Steven lost his fucking mind. I was excited, but I didn't shit my pants like he did. Um, sorry. Steven was so excited. I was obviously very, so that you don't have to put your pants shitting clip in there. <laughs> and just like that, six weeks of competition comes to an end. Congratulations to Steven and Courtney Capps of Leviathan Snakes. I picked Leviathan Snakes because, because all those things I said, their interview was good. They had, uh, they definitely had invested money in themselves and their business and their projects. They already had a successful social media presence, YouTube, Instagram, all that. They were taking this serious before they were ever on 15 Minutes of Lame. So that was a big part of it. And then the, the campaign, the, the comedy that they were doing on the reels was hilarious to me. And they were poking funs at the judges and it was, it was just a good, it was a good all around vibe. I thought it brought more attention to the, the contest in general. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, it, there was, uh, I thought Jana from ASM Royal Tales, she put in a lot of work too. So it was, it was pretty close, but I had to give the edge to Leviathan. I mean, the, just the, the quality of the reels they put out were, that's stuff I can't do, yeah, so. I think you guys put the most work into it, like the most, the most time, the most effort, like the, the creativity for your videos, just the campaigning, the, dude, the, the, the fact that it's so memorable, they made me laugh, they just was, it was just all, the whole, every time I clicked, got tagged in something, and I watched it, I was like, oh, another video. Like, I was looking forward to it. You know, like at, at noon Eastern when the Justin video comes out on Friday, I was looking forward to you guys with a video. Like, if I didn't see one that week, I'm like, what the hell? Like, I'm like, going, I'm like, okay, did they not tag me into it too? So I was excited to see a video from you guys. You know what I mean? So, um, like, dude, when you guys put on the skull caps, the fake bald head, I about peed on myself during that one. <laughs> that shit had me rolling, man, so. Yeah, they, that, that's what it was, man. And, and you guys just, you guys nailed that, man. And um, this, I don't know who's in charge of the, the storyboards and ideas, but you two together, putting it together, man, you guys are a force, so. And uh, yeah, I think you guys are gonna be great for a long time. So I saw your first video. I, you know, you could ask Donato, you could ask, you know, I was like, I don't have a vote, but I would think that Leviathan is probably you know, gonna kill this thing because your guys' videos were, I, I mean, the bokeh that you had in your video alone is was just like so professional that I was like, you know, wait, are these guys using a mic? 
are these guys using a fucking expensive camera? I'm like, these are probably the guys that are gonna win. Um, and you were funny. In any year of the contest, uh, ones that could have easily won and, and carried the torch proudly would be like Patrick McKnight from McKnight Stables, Corey Martin, uh, Bod's Exotic Reptiles, Alyssa from Full Throttle, Jana from ASM, Reggie from Reggie's Urban Jungle. That's definitely one. I mean, that guy's gonna be around for a long time. Uh, Andrew from Redwood Reptiles. They, these are all Patrick Chung from Dragon Soul Reptiles. These are all people that are are legitimate in their own right. You know, and they they could carry the torch too, and and I would be proud to call them my you know alumni too. You know, Reggie made me laugh the most. Like, <laughs> his, you know, because Reggie was uh you know coming to his own with like TikTok, and we were in like a lot of Facebook groups together where he was making just a bunch of reels and just watching his creativity with those reels over there. Um, just like increased exponentially throughout the years. What does it mean for me, to me, to have like won? Um, I think it was really awesome to be able to promote, promote ourselves in the moment. I think we got a lot of people kind of talking about us, saying our name and stuff during the contest. Um, but I also feel like it's going to mean something going forward. I think a lot of people are ex getting more and more excited about the contest as time goes on. It's starting to like have more of a um, place in the reptile community. More people are talking about it, more people know about it. And I think this year already, a lot of people are excited to be on the show. Not that people weren't excited to be on it in the past, but I think people are going into it this year with the hopes of campaigning and winning. So I've noticed um, people making a point to do things that could get them recognized specifically to be on 15 Minutes of Lame and show off that they have the skills to campaign once it's time to start campaigning like they're they haven't even their their segment hasn't even aired yet and they're already reminding people that they're going to be campaigning in the um winter so i think that's really cool and it's going to uh continue to make a difference for us going forward that makes me feel great now you, you know that people are actually wanting that that call or email to come on I mean, that's, uh, that's a position I never thought it would be in from doing this to make fun of people till now, you know, and uh, it's, a, you know, it, yeah, it's fun, it's cool, it's a cool thing. I don't want to be doing it forever, but, but it, is, uh, it, it is something that I appreciate, like, more than you guys know, because I would have never thought there'd be a hundred people lined up to do this fucking stupid show, and there are now, so... Uh, I, I don't take that lightly. That's why I do. I mean, I, I don't really feel like doing this show twice a month, but I do it because we could, you know, help promote these other guys. So, so I don't know. I, I look forward to being invited back as a judge anytime for this because, like, I believe that's me, my way of giving back to the 15 Minutes Lame contest. And every single person that was like competed in year three. Like, I was in personal messages with them, like, cheering them on. Like, a lot of people ask me, like, well, what do you think I should do? And I would give a good advice, you know, I can't, like, totally plan it out for them, but, like, I'm there to root everyone on, and I like being a part of that. It's really fun for me. So I look forward to coming back as a judge whenever needed. Have fun. <laughs> you have to have fun with this thing, man. Like, you can't, like, if you, if you take this as a job, like, you're not gonna, enjoy, you're not gonna be successful. You have to make, like, okay, I'm 41 years old. I got, I got a gray beard, my back is out. I'm always sore all the time, I beat the heck up, but I always find a way to, to laugh and enjoy life. I will, even the darkest times of my life when my grandmother died, the closest person to me and I was ever laughed, I made sure I found a reason to laugh that day. You have to have a good time, you gotta smile, and you have to find a way to enjoy yourself, man. Because if you don't, you're not gonna, if you're just kind of ambling through life and going through the motions, man, you're just wasting your time. What are you doing? Do something else. So if you're coming to the hobby now, make sure you're doing everything that you enjoy to do. So, and if you can't figure out, and if you're not having fun with stuff that you have to do, find a way to have fun and enjoy yourself.